Hey everybody, welcome to um, your next lecture and it's jumping ahead on me and that's not what I meant to do. Uh, we're going to talk about safety and preparedness. This is chapter two, okay? Main learning objective, objectives here is how do we keep ourselves, our patients, and our coworkers safe, both from injury and infection. We're going to see um, basically there's different symbols and systems and warning signs and things that we're going to see around our workspace that are going to help us know what to do, how to keep ourselves safe, actions to take, et cetera, and that will make more sense when we get to it. We're also going to take, talk a little bit in brief, but about PATH and RACE, which are acronyms to help us if there's a fire emergency. Safety is everyone's responsibility. And as we mentioned in chapter one, um, not only, well, not only are we keeping ourselves safe, but we're also keeping our patients safe. And we're responsible for their safety and well being from the moment right before we're taking care of them while we're performing our, um, our specimen collection until after as well, until they're out of our care. So before we jump into bloodborne pathogens specifically, I just want to mention what medical biohazards are, okay? So medical biohazards are any biological substances that can threaten human health. This can include any material that may be contaminated with an infectious agent. The handling and disposal of these items or objects is regulated by three different organizations, really. OSHA, which we talked about in our last lecture, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and state regulatory agencies. All biohazardous waste must be handled with gloves and disposed of in bags or containers that are red and clearly labeled. And you'll see some images of that in just a slide or two uh, forward, okay? Um, so bloodborne pathogen standard. This was developed by OSHA in 1991 to reduce the risk of injury and infection from biohazardous waste. It requires that all employees receive annual training on preventing exposure, proper PPE, and standard precautions. If you've ever worked in a medical facility before or when you do down the road, you're going to get these yearly trainings that you're going to have to do um, for this. And, you know, you get over and you think, oh, I'm doing this again. It's the same information. There are some changes from time to time as things get updated and are more safe. But it's always a good reminder. So even though it seems like you're doing it every year, do I really need to? Yes is the answer. Take it seriously. Read through it. Make sure you are familiar with, comfortable with, and aware of what you need to do. Um, or how to keep yourself safe. All employees, so this uh, bloodborne pathogen standard stated that all employees must implement self, uh, excuse me, infection control practices, use any safety on devices that are available, and properly dispose of potentially infectious material. So it's our responsibility as the employee, as a staff, to know how to do and to implement all of those items. All staff should regularly review safety practices, practices and precautions as they do get updated and changed. And each facility must have an exposure control plan. You need to know what that is, the exposure control plan. This is what you follow if you're exposed. And in, in this plan must include these elements. It has to list the level at which each employee is at risk for exposure, what precautions to take, and what to do if there is an accidental exposure to hazardous materials. If body fluids come in contact with the eyes, nose, or mouth, so that's our mucous membrane, you want to immediately flush the area with a lot of water, report the exposure, do an incident report, and then get medical evaluation as soon as you can afterwards to not only assess any potential injury, but to determine if any necessary testing or follow-up or excuse me, to determine if any testing or follow-up is necessary. Again, that's when we get a potentially exposed to our mucous membrane. Now, when we're talking about sharps and needle sticks, the, the protocol for that is slightly different, okay? So let me talk real quick here about the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act. And actually, let me put in my notes real quick here. Yeah. Um, that's the bloodborne pathogen biohazard, uh, not bloodborne pathogen, excuse me, biohazard symbol that you will see on containers and bags that have biohazards in them. There is strict record keeping on bloodborne pathogen um, that's required by the bloodborne pathogen standards. You have to have a log of all sharps containers. And if there is any incident, along with um, 
writing an incident report, which I'm going to talk about in a second here, you do need to log the injury, the needle stick injury on a, on a specific log as well. Um, when we're talking about housekeeping practices, using the appropriate containers, it is really important if you have to put anything in a biohazard container um, or bag, um, again, make sure it's done properly, labeled correctly. Anything that has a moderate or greater amount of blood or body fluids on it will go into a biohazard, biohazard bag or sharps container. The Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act. This was passed in 2001 and it mandates the use of safety devices like you see in that image in the bottom right corner of your slide um, that reduce needle stick injuries in the clinical setting. Uh, the objective of this mandate was to protect both employees and patients from coming in contact with potentially harmful materials. Any needle stick injury, um, or excuse me, a needle stick injury is any piercing wound that is caused by the point of a needle, lancet, blade, or a glass slide. So again, you, you, you read this, you think of, of um, puncture wounds, uh, bloodborne pathogens. A lot of times we think of needles, but it can be other sharp objects as well. When we're talking about needles, we never want to break off, recap, or reuse a needle. We must use sharps containers for proper, proper disposal of sharps or needles, immediately engage the safety feature and place in the sharps container. And what they mean by that is, let's say I just took out the needle from drawing blood, I'm not gonna set the needle down on the bedside table um, and just leave it there, okay? I'm gonna withdraw it, I'm gonna immediately do the safety feature and immediately walk it over to the sharps container. Don't wanna leave anything sitting on a bed or a bedside table. You never wanna overfill a sharps container. There's actually gonna be a line on it that says three fourths full and that's your fill line. Do not go above, do not stuff things in. In the event of an accidental needle stick, you want to do a couple of things. The very first thing is the immediate decontamination of the site. And that can be done with an antiseptic or an aseptic like an iodine or soap and water is sufficient as well. After you have cleaned the site, I mentioned that safe, that sharps log. You want to document it in the sharps uh, incident log and do an incident report for your facility. Step number three would be getting a medical examination. Again, this is to determine, first of all, look at the injury itself, but also to determine the level of risk in the next proper steps. After you've been stuck by a potentially contaminated sharp or a contaminated sharp, we need to get the patient or the source blood's lab results. So we're gonna get labs from our patient that we were drawing from and get HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C um, test results. If the patient has any of those infectious diseases, or if for some reason we're not able to get those lab results from the patient, like maybe they've left, we did this in an outpatient setting, they've gone home and we cannot get in touch with them, then we're gonna go ahead and get our, the exposed person, the employee's labs drawn as well for those same things, HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And then this is when the medical doctor, whoever examined you is gonna help gauge the level of risk um, and decide if there's any treatment necessary and what kind of follow-up is necessary. So NIOSH or the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health actually plays a big role in, um, in uh, sharps safety and um, biohazard exposure as well. Uh, they provide guidelines and regulate and promote actions to maximize safety. They um, say that the implement, oh, excuse me, they, they mandate that we implement the use of devices with safety features and then evaluate their use. They tell us uh, that we need to look at other facilities, other places. What have they done to prevent these needle stick injuries, these sharps injuries, and was it successful? So should we implement these things or should we try something else? They also mandate that we modify our work environments to make them safer. So as we learn things, as incident ha incidents happen, that's why we document them. That's why we do incident reports, to learn from these mistakes. So what caused this needle stick in the first place and how can we make our work environment safer so it doesn't happen again? Um, so NIOSH, in addition to also kind of mandating being another um, to mandating how we deal with uh, 
biohazards and sharps and prevent these things from happening again. They also mandate what sharps containers must have and must be. And what I mean by that is, let me see if there's a, did that, sorry, I didn't go forward on my slides like I should have. Um, okay, we're not quite there yet. Um, NIOSH standards for sharps containers say that they must include the following four things. They must be functional. That means that our sharps containers need to be leak and puncture resistant, durable, the appropriate size, and they must have a secure closure. They must be accessible. They must be upright, easy to operate and reach, below eye level so you can see what you're doing, not having to reach up and you know in. And they must be away from obstructed areas. So they can't be by doorways or sinks. So what that means is if I'm over here messing with some sharps and I need to immediately dispose it, and my sharps container is behind the sink, but somebody's washing their hands, that prevents me from immediately getting into that sharps container. So they can't be in any area where that may be obstructed. Visibility, they have to have the fill level and the fact that it's biohazard clearly marked and visible. And accommodation, meaning they must require only minimal training to use. They have to be easy to use, easy to operate. Um, they must be, durable, uh, must be durable and stable in their mounting system as well. You don't want them falling off of the wall. So in our workplace, in the healthcare setting, we are also at risk to being exposed to hazardous drugs. This is something that um, NIOSH, or again, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health also helps to regulate. Um, they frequently update the list of hazardous drugs and recommendations for the safe handling for um, phlebotomists. And you should be aware of these hazards, especially when you might be drawing um, blood or taking specimens from repeatedly from patients who have these uh, hazardous drugs in their system. Probably the most common or the best example of these would be cancer drugs, right? Um, um, antivirals, cancer drugs. Long-term exposure to these hazardous drugs can cause acute or chronic illness. So that's why it's important to know these guidelines, know what NIOSH says are the recommendations for handling um, and disposal and to keep, to keep you and your patients safe. All right, finally, I can go on to my next slide. Sorry about that. So cleaning up biohazardous spills. Um, you want to clean them up immediately. A lot of facilities are going to have this biohazard spill kit that you're going to use. You want to make sure that you have proper PPE on and follow any facility protocols. You have an SDS that we're going to talk about in a minute. So don't worry about that quite yet. Um, and that's going to give you all of the information and instructions you need to know how to properly clean up any biohazard or bodily fluid spills. Um, so make sure to reference your SDS and know where that exists in your office or in your facility. And it might be a paper version or it might be online. So the SDS, the safety data sheet. I thought I had skipped a, a let me see on my notes. I think I had put that further back in my notes, but I can always come back to that. Okay, no worries. Um, so the SDS is the safety data sheet. This is a requirement. OSHA, you have to have this on hand. Again, like I said, it can be paper or online. Um, they contain the following information. It's every single chemical substance that is in your facility. It identifies it, gives first aid measurements, um, handling and storage, the toxicology information, and um, different ways in which it's appropriate to clean it up. So again, make sure you know where these are. Eye wash stations, make sure you know where your eye wash stations are and how to operate them. And usually next to the eye wash station is gonna be the shower. This is if you have spilled some sort of chemical on you or blood or body fluid splashed into the eyes um, or else on an open cut or something and you need to wash yourself off with copious amounts of water, whether it be directly into the eyes or over the body. All right, let me see. I'm gonna skip that video for now. Um, so before we go into fire safety, I want to talk about a couple more things. So personal safety and preparedness. Um, uh, most laboratories are going to have a safety officer. This person is responsible for implementing uh, laboratory safety programs. So we're coming up with these safety programs, implementing them, and then evaluating are their effectiveness. What kind of changes do we need to make? 
Each member of the healthcare team, of course, is responsible for their own safety, but also, like we've said several times, the safety of patients and their, and their coworkers as well. So physical hazards, these are any non biological We've been talking a lot about biohazards, hazardous chemicals or medications. There are also physical hazards. Um, these are any non-biological objects that can cause injury, illness, such as you know, electrical systems, fire hazards, radiation, or improper body mechanics, so ergonomics. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. There's you know, common sense safety, right? This is things like don't run. If there's a wet floor sign, don't you know, be, use extra caution, don't walk on it. Don't wear dangling jewelry. Um, if you're wondering why that's on there, if you're thinking about if you have um, an earring that hangs down or a necklace and you're working with a patient drawing blood, you could get caught on um, some of your equipment. If they're confused, they could pull on it. There's a lot of things, um, reasons that that's not the best idea. Tying back long hair, it can get contaminated. It can contaminate other things. And then uh, of course, common sense, operating the equipment as instructed. Always know how to do these things before attempting. When we're talking about ergonomics, I had mentioned that, or body mechanics, this is a, the practice of adapting a job or task or equipment so that you can pr perform it safely. Um, this would be sitting rather than standing while you're performing a blood draw. If you're hunched over and uncomfortable, you're gonna hurt your back. Um, placing equipment close to the procedure area so you're not having to like reach and twist. These are all things that even the tiniest thing, you might not expect it, but can cause injury. Lift and move objects properly. So don't lift with your back. Use our strong uh, thigh muscles to do the lifting. Uh, and then of course, asking for help when, when it's appropriate and when needed. Something else to keep in mind, um, you know, it's kind of more of a side note, but you know, when we work in the healthcare setting, we're exposed to certain things over and over and over again. One of the, one of the best examples is latex, right? There's a lot of latex things. Probably the one you're most familiar with is latex gloves. It is possible that you develop a latex allergy over time with use. Now you see less and less latex gloves around because there are so many people with latex allergies. Um, but you wanna be aware of these things. If you're using the same materials over and over again, certain alcohol rubs um, or alcohol rubs have been known on rare occasions to cause allergies as well. If you start to notice anything like itching, redness, um, respiratory responses, be aware of these and make sure to report them. Uh, electrical hazards. These can include any contact with electrical equipment or the failure of equipment that creates a dangerous condition. You can get shocked, burned, electrocuted, or of course we can have explosions. So what we need to remember here is don't use equipment that's damaged. And if you see something that looks damaged, report it right away. And usually know your facility policy, but usually there's gonna be some sort of tag that you can put on there if you know that it's not functioning properly so that somebody else doesn't get hurt trying to use it. Um, and if equipment is damages, malfunctions, makes an unusual sound or smell, definitely don't use it. And if you have the ability to turn off the power source to it without turning off power to something that <laughs> needs to stay on, go ahead and do that as well. But now we can go ahead and talk about fire um, safety or fire hazard. Um, so, this can include a variety of things. We've kind of touched on when we talked about electrical hazards. Overloaded circuit, electrical circuits are a fire risk. Misuse of chemicals, carelessness, lack of training. Um, blocked fire escapes are a fire hazard. Uh, in case of a fire, this is where you need to know um, race and paths, okay? We also need to make sure that we're participating in yearly training and drills. I know, again, that's one of those other things that we do on a regular or at least a yearly basis that everyone kind of rolls their eyes at and is like, oh, here we go again, but it's important. And it's so important in the healthcare setting because not only are we responsible for ourselves when we have a fire or a fire drill, we have to think about the patients in and around us uh, or in, in and around the facility uh, as well as our coworkers. Know where your fire extinguishers are located as well. So race, this is the acronym to remember if a fire happens, we get a fire alarm, right? So it's um, our rescue. So we're gonna get those who need immediate help out of the way. Activate the fire alarm or phone in the fire alarm. Contain the fire as much as possible. Usually that involves shutting all doors. Extinguish the fire if possible um, or call the fire department to do so. so 
when we're talking about using a fire extinguisher, we get PASS. This is our uh, acronym to remember that. We want to pull the hand, the pin in the handle, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the handle, and sweep from side to side again at the base of the fire. Ah, there's my image of ergonomics. I apologize for my slides being a little bit out of order. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to add. Uh, I, I didn't talk specifically about your workspace, but you are going to be documenting and working in the computer a lot. In ergonomics, in, in, at your desk, in your chair, plays a big role. For example, this screen that I'm, or this video that I'm recording right now, it's on a laptop, but it is on a raised surface. Because if I had the laptop down on the actual desk, I'd be in this position where I'm looking down the creek in the neck, right? You've seen those things that support the wrist when you're at your computer. The, the angle of the computer screen itself, the level of your chair, having something to put your feet on. These are all things that you can do as well to assist with proper ergonomics and body mechanics, okay? Let me see here. Talk about proper and bear with me because when I switch from my um, me talking to the video, I have to click out of it. So give me a second here and I will See if I can get this video to play for you, okay? Well, maybe it's not going to. Okay, sorry guys, we can play this in. Um, I will either put a link for that on your online website or we can play it in our in-person in the skills lab, okay? So I'll find something for that for you guys. I apologize for that malfunction. There's always something. Um, Let's see, I was gonna talk a little bit about chemical hazards and radioactive hazards, and then we are all set, okay? So chemical hazards, we talked about a lot of different types of hazards. As you're reading through this chapter, get yourself, you know, get yourself organized. Make a little chart if you need to, um, just so you're kind of familiar with these different things. So chemical hazards include harmful or potentially harmful chemicals that are used by healthcare employees, and you may come across this um, in the lab. These could be, for example, strong acids or strong bases. If a chemical contacts the skin or eyes, the best first aid is immediate flushing with copious amounts of water. So like we said in that slide before about knowing where your eye wash and your shower are, this is another reason, not only for blood or body fluid exposure, but chemicals as well. OSHA mandates that healthcare facilities develop and implement plans to protect healthcare workers from exposure. This includes chemical hygiene plans, biohazard exposure control plans, and hazard, hazardous material handling plans. OSHA requires, um, as we know already, that that safety data sheet, the SDS. Again, like I had mentioned on that slide, this is where we're going to find out um, about different chemicals as well. Guidelines for handling chemicals. You want to use glassware that's appropriate for the task, proper PPE. When diluting an acid, you always add the acid to water, never in the other way, or you can cause burns. If you're working with chemicals in the lab, you want to know and observe proper storing and disposal. Properly store compressed gas cylinders. The most common we think of is oxygen tanks, right? That's compressed gas. It has to be held up and secured against a wall or on a cart or whatever. It has to be secured because if that tips over, it can cause serious injury or death because of the compressed gas being released too quickly and powerfully. Laboratory workers um, also use chemical fume hoods when handling hazardous chemicals or sometimes when opening specimen containers that have these hazardous uh, preservatives in them. You have to make sure before you use a hood, if you ever use a fume hood in the lab, you have to have the proper training to do so. Radioactive hazards, finally, we're gonna to touch on that just really briefly. These exist when ionizing radiation is present. Um, you got, we think of this when we think of radiation therapy for cancer patients. Radiation is basically energy traveling through space. Um, but ionizing radiation, why it affects us is, it be, is because it can destabilize molecules within our cells and cause tissue damage, essentially. The radiation is used for diagnostic imaging and therapy. Some labs will also, test, um, also have tests using radioactive compounds, which is why you have to have this on your radar as well. Know when they're being used, reference your SDS. Um, know the proper, proper handling and disposal, proper PPE, et cetera. So when it comes to safety and preparedness in the lab, there's a lot to think about. I know it seems overwhelming. 
we have all these regulatory agencies, we have all these people and organizations and agencies who are mandating all these different ways to um, handle these biohazards, these chemicals, et cetera. You have to be familiar with these things. Um, you don't have to memorize all of this. That's the nice thing, but you have to know where to access it. You have to know the basics. You have to have some common sense and know when to get some help, okay? If you have any questions on any of this, please let myself or Michelle know and we will be happy to help you. And pay a special attention to all the safety signs and what they mean. And that's great advice too, because these safety signs, you do need to be able to recognize them and know when it's like telling you, hey, stop, look, think, and act appropriately. All right, thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day.